Good morning. So uh, just real quick, my name is Chad Mason. I'm so happy to get to be with you guys this morning. I'm excited to be here, and, uh, and you'll probably get to know real fast that I, can't, I don't stand still very well. I, I move around a little bit. And so if, if I start causing whiplash, just tell me. I'll, uh, I'll turn here to the beginning in the middle, and I'll do my best to stay there. Uh, there's so much that my heart wants to say to you today, and uh, so many things that I, I want to share. But I want to tell you that the video that the, that the search committee put together last week really says it all. So we could stop right there, and, uh, and you guys could, no, I tell you, there's very few times in a pastor's career where people put them at the center of attention. So much of our work uh, as ministers is to put Jesus at the center of everything. And, uh, and, and it's such a, uh, the main part of my heart and life is to, to make him known in all ways. And so to see over the last few weeks how you guys have been such a blessing and talked about how many good things God has been a part of in my life, it's really, on, it's, it's really humbling and it's, uh, it's really a, a strange thing to be the center of attention for a little while. And so I just want to say thank you to the search committee. You guys have been amazing. First Baptist Church in Bernie, you guys have been so kind to me. The few times I've got to come spend time here on this campus and with your staff and with the search committee, I have been blessed and my family has been blessed and it has been a great honor for us to get to know you. Uh, and so we're so thankful that we get to spend some time with you. I want to tell you about four great blessings that God has given me in my life. And, and in, in doing that, maybe it'll give you a little introduction to me and, uh, and to my family as well. And so the first thing that I think is one of the greatest blessings of my life has been the church. You know, uh, I, I've been a part of ministry in the church for over 20 years now, and it has been the, the basis for everything that God has done inside of me. It's where I found my closest friends, my advisors. It's been the people that have pushed me forward and said, Chad, I think God's calling you to do these things. And, and I've heard God speak to me through the people around me. And the church has just been an unbelievable place for me to find hope and find support and find confidence, to find my wife and family. It's been an, an amazing place. And, uh, and so I want to tell you that this place and, and these people, it's not just a place where you come and, and get to sing every weekend and hear a good message. It's a place where you find community. It's a place where you find hope. And, and it's a place where people can hold you up when you're weak and strengthen you when you need help. And it's a place where you can bless many others. And so the church, I, can't, I cannot overstate the impact that the church itself has had in my life. It's an unbelievable thing. And the body of Christ is so amazing how when we get together, God does things that none of us can do on our own. Amen. I want to tell you another just incredible blessing that God has given me uh, has been my daughters. You're going to meet them, Michaela and Aliana, one's 12 and one's nine. Those two girls have changed our life in ways that we never would have dreamed. If you've had kids, you know what I'm talking about. You think you have everything together when you're young and single, and then you get married and you learn a lot. And then you have kids and you realize you're still kids, right? You realize how much more there is to learn. And, uh, and so Michaela is our firstborn. I call her like our, t our training wheels. God gave us, she, she's a really calm kind of personality and, and, and uh, an easygoing spirit. And she has just helped us and, and we love her. And it's been amazing. Allie is our road race. She's the one that's gonna, she's running as fast as she can, as hard as she can. And we're trying our best to keep up with her. Uh, both of them are like this odd mix of both of us. And it's really odd because it's not us, but it's like us. And you kind of see yourself in it. And sometimes it makes you nervous because you're like, oh, I remember how that worked itself out in me. I hope that they have a little bit better task with it. But those two girls have been such an abundant blessing in my life, and I know to Elise's life as well. And the next blessing, I, I, obviously you're going to see this coming, is my wife Elise. We met 16 years ago in 2005 on a mission trip. I flew from Seattle to Houston. Her dad is, a, was, is the president of a small children's home in Mexico. And, uh, and as we landed, I was, in, I was like, hey, I'm going back to Texas. I was in a tank top and shorts and flip-flops. I was carrying my guitar. Elise reminds me that I was wearing a shark tooth, a shark tooth necklace. Uh, I think I had a South Padre Island tank top on. Our flight was delayed, so I didn't arrive till like one or two in the morning, and they had driven a long way to Houston to pick me up. They were exhausted, and I was excited. I was ready. Let's go. We're going to Mexico. We had a, a great trip that time, and, and that was the beginning of the end for my father-in-law. He's been disappointed and frustrated ever since, but um, Elise has been wonderful, and, uh, and it has been an incredible thing. Elise has a huge heart for missions in the world. One of the most difficult things about being a pastor's wife is that they're always in the background, and uh, they have a huge calling and a voice, and so many times those voices are not able to be shared as much. And, and so I would encourage you uh, in two ways, to care for my family. If God is gonna put in your heart to call us to this church, then I ask that you would also realize that God's calling you to care for them. Our success in the future here, if God calls you to call us here, 
If God does that, our success, my success, is going to depend on them. It's going to depend on how they feel loved and welcomed and cared for. And if they're not, it's going to be really hard to be successful here. And so I want to thank God for those two blessings, my children and my wife. And that leads me to the ultimate blessing. It's my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I was in fifth grade when I went to a camp in Hasty, Arkansas, a little, little camp called Rock Haven Bible, Bible Camp. And uh, at that camp, my dad sent me because he talked to somebody that said it was a good place to send kids. So they sent me. We weren't, we weren't a believing family at the time. And when I went there, there was this missionary talking about this Jesus that could change lives in Africa. And I thought, if God can change lives in Africa, maybe he can change lives in Arkansas too. And so I told the, the, the meet and greet yesterday that the first day I said the prayer, it didn't work because I, I didn't feel like God did anything different. So I went back up the next night and said, I don't think I said the prayer correctly because nothing changed. And so they said, well, come on, let's talk about it. I spent some time with a man that counseled me that night, and when I prayed, it was like fire was in my veins. This Jesus came into my life, and he changed me. And he changed me forever. He's never been far from me. I went through the army. I've been through lots and lots of places on the earth. I've been in places where I felt the Holy Spirit warning me that there's danger around. But ever, every single time and every single place I've ever been, God has been a close and present comfort to me. And I've been so thankful for him. I can't tell you, I, can, I mean, I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, I would not be here if it wasn't for him. I probably would not have met my wife or my children. I wouldn't have my children. And I would not have met the church that has continued to bless me all these years. And so my, my greatest thanks and everything is to my Lord. He is the king of my life. And I want to serve him with everything that I am and everything that I want to become. Oh. <sighs> You guys know a lot about me if you've watched the videos or if you talk to the search committee. Uh, they have close to probably 16 hours of interview with me. Probably, I think it's all been recorded and passed around the staff. There's a lot of information uh, about me available uh, to that search committee. And I want to tell you, it has been a great honor. But you know, what, what Mark said a little while ago, that God can do the impossible, is really the focus of what our scriptures are going to talk about today. You looked at the sermon that, that Peter did last week uh, there in Acts chapter 2. And it doesn't, it sets off what I want to call the launching of the global church. It's, it's the beginning of the church doing what only Jesus was doing before. In the Old Testament, we get lots of stories of, of faithful people that God did amazing things through, but it's really rare to see whole groups doing faithful things. And what happens in that chapter, Acts chapter 2, it's where the impossible that God did and a few people before became possible for everyone that would call in the name of the Lord Jesus. Every single one of us can go and see the impossible in our life when we ask Jesus to be the king of our life. He can take a kid from a little tiny town in Arkansas and take him all over the world and then stand before you today asking for you to consider God calling us to this church. How does that happen except by the grace of God? God can do the impossible. What we're going to see in these next few verses is that God does that exact thing. Listen to this. He takes these few people. You remember there's only, there's only 12 disciples, 11, because Judas had died, and, and, and they're trying to figure out how to follow Jesus. The, the, the Spirit of God comes on them while they're in the upper room, and they go out the tongues of fire on their head, and they're speaking in languages all over, and all this is happening with just a few. Maybe 520 is what Corinthians tells us, just a few. And then what happens this day, this, this first day, the launch of the church, is nothing less than impossible. So we're going to look at these verses, starting with, with me in Acts chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 41 and, uh, and read through the end of the chapter, verse 47. It says that those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Think about it. They went from 520-ish <laughs> to 3,000 in a day. We're going to talk a little bit more about that here in a little bit. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. How many of you have heard this passage before? Oh, good, a couple of you. Listen, this is looked at as like when the church had its fantastic and beautiful start. I hope that you've been a part of a body of Christ that resembled this in some form. Like, how many of you want to go to dinner and enjoy with glad and sincere hearts the people that you're having dinner with? That's a good thing, right? 
Like, think about all the ways that, all the things are described. They sold their possessions and they gave it to everybody and there was none who had need. Have you ever been in that place where you didn't have any needs? Have you ever been in a community that was so loving and cared for each other in such a way that there was none of them who were in poverty? It's an incredible picture of this early church. It's an incredible moment in the life of the church. It sets a standard for us that we can say, man, that's when we're looking like we've got things together is when God is meeting the needs of everybody in our community. What a powerful picture it is. I want you to look with me, uh, and we're going to look at 10 different items, I think, that you can take from these, these verses, and, and I want you to see what they are. So we're going to start with, with really, we're going to jump back just a little bit to verse 37, where it says that Peter finished his message, and the people were cut to the heart. You remember that from last week? They were cut to the heart. They said, what must we do to be saved? And what did Peter tell them? Repent and believe. And that becomes the really clear first step for the church is that we need to be calling people to repent and believe, turn from their wickedness and seek Jesus as their king. It's the most simple step of what a new believer in a church needs to be seeing is that God calls them to turn away. It's a 180 when we talk about what that word means, repent. And so repent and believe. The next thing it says, be baptized, right? They were all baptized. I just want to ask you a question. How did they baptize 3,000 people in a day? Have you ever thought about the logistics of that by itself? Pastor Jason, how many have you baptized in a day? <laughs> five, five, five. We, we had a, a Sunday a few years ago in our Spanish church in Calvary, and uh, we said, hey, there's maybe a lot of you who have never been baptized, and we just, we realized we haven't offered, would you like to? And 65 people got baptized in one day. That was a lot. That was a lot. 65 people in a day. We had three or four different guys who took turns in the, in the, in the baptismal. It's not a dunk tank. It's a baptismal. And, uh, and uh, 65 people were baptized. And 3,000 is what we're finding out here. Think about that. So I, I want you to see that those first two things we talked about, repent and believe and baptism, they really focus on new believers. It's how people become part of the church. Do you see that? So people who are on the outside now become part of the fellowship by these two items. Repent and believe and be baptized. And then you've got this other list. Uh, if we keep going, I'm going to call these next six kind of church life, maybe the rhythms of a church. And so you've got the, the teaching of the word in verse 42. You have the fellowship daily, by the way. Do you ever catch that they gathered daily? Like we put a lot of emphasis in the church on having a personal devotion where you spend time in the word and in prayer daily. You all heard that, right? But what about this idea that you should fellowship daily? Why would that be the case? It's because when we fellowship daily, we get to spend time together. It's, it's what life on life looks like. It's what it looks like when the disciples walk with Jesus between towns and do things. Now, obviously, we don't walk very much today. It's a very different thing. But we do have lots of ways to be interacting with each other daily. If you're part of a community group here at the church, you're part of a grow group in any way, I bet you guys have maybe a chat group. Do you have a chat in your, where you can say, hey guys, will you pray for me? I've had a rough day and everybody in the group can pray for you or see that. If you don't, you should. It's just a small way to be connected to each other in a, in a really short and easy way. Uh, we, we, you might find that there's some of you that say, hey, I like you guys so much. We have breakfast once a week in addition to what we do on Sundays and Wednesdays. And, and those are ways to just continue to have that life on life where you're close to each other. The, the word encourages us to to be together daily. I'm, I'm going to get really distracted here, so I'll stop. All right. So teaching of the word, fellowship, communion, where they, they're breaking bread together. They're obviously in prayer. It says that they gave from their possessions. They sold it and they had things in common. They worshiped together. Do you see that? And so I want to see those six things to me, just to, to kind of describe a healthy church. These are the things that happen in the life of a church. Where, do you guys do these things here? Yeah, is there anything missing from this list when you look at it and you just kind of say, well, let's see, the First Baptist Church, Bernie, do we study the word? Do we hear the word? Yeah, sure. Do we fellowship together? I hope so, right? Do you pray together? We've already prayed multiple times this morning. Do we take communion? Do you guys do that here? Yeah, okay, good, good, good. That's a good Baptist thing. It's a good Baptist church, a good Christian activity. Uh, worship, we just finished that. And giving, I heard just last week that you guys are outstanding in your giving. You guys have already seen that you're gonna have a surplus this year. That is a phenomenal thing in this day and age. There are a lot of churches around the country that are struggling to meet budget. To, see a, to be a part of a church that's exceeding it is really an exciting idea. So I wanna say well done on that level. 
So there's so many other things we could talk about. If you go through that list, uh, if you go through those verses, you might see that there's other things like signs and wonders. Uh, there's the, the selling property. Um, there's also uh, the glad and sincere hearts. But for, for, uh, for today's message, we're just going to look at those 10. And I want to tell you that there's two others. So I want you just to take a minute. Look around. I, I told Elise, I love these pillars. Whoever designed this did a really good job. It makes me think of like Solomon and temples. And I mean, I don't, I don't know if that's why they were there, but that's what it makes me. I love the white rock that's so to me, San Antonio and Austin. And, and it's so cool. I love the way it looks. But, but look around and think about all the things that God has prepared First Baptist Church for. Think about the facilities, how much time went into planning them, how much money was invested in, in development and building and construction costs. How about maintenance? It costs a lot to keep these buildings in good condition. All of that has taken planning and time and work. And what, are, what is it for? Why did people give all the time and money that it took to put this place together? Why did they do it? Was it so that they could have a steeple taller than the church down the street? Probably not. Somebody might have said that at some point. At Calvary, the church I met, there's a, there's a leader in our church who's like, we have the tallest steeple in the city. And I'm like, okay, that's, very, that's exciting. Um, then uh, the steeple leaked and they took the steeple down for two years. <laughs> it made me laugh a little bit. Anyway, I'll stop. Um, <laughs> it's back up now. They're the highest point. Anyway, so what went into making this place what it is? A lot of effort, right? And there's a purpose behind it. And the purpose is not just for the comfort of those that attend here. I know that that's an important part of it and definitely was considered along the way. But it's because the people who had the vision and the sacrifice to put this together, they saw something that could, could extend the kingdom of God to this community and to the end of the earth, right? This mission of God is such a big part of everything that we hold dear to us and making it possible for people to hear from each other and, and spend time together and have community life in a place like this is such a valuable thing for, for new believers as they come. For, for established Christians who are trying to love each other and, and push each other out with, with love and good deeds, as the word says, all those things are reasons that made this become a really instrumental and powerful place. Do you agree with me? Okay. So think about this. The disciples didn't have any of this. 3,000 were added to their number that day, and they didn't have a place to put them. They didn't have a staff to send them to. They didn't even have a deacon board. If you remember, there was no deacons at that time. They didn't have deacons. They just had the 520 from before. So I want to ask you a few questions about the disciples. Uh, and maybe we'll just start here. Maybe if God were to do something special today and add 3,000 new believers to us, this, a Pentecost type event here in Bernie, what would we do? What would you do? What'd you say? Celebrate. You'd celebrate. We'd say, amen. Praise God. And well, uh, for sure. But let's get a little practical. Who would lead them? Who would baptize them? Who would disciple them? Who would break bread together with them with glad and sincere hearts? Who would, who would gather with them daily to help them become fully formed followers of Jesus? Who would do the work of helping them go from new believer to fully formed Jesus follower? Who would do it? If you say Jason, I'd say, well, Jason, are you ready for that? You might say, hey, we just are about to hire another pastor, hopefully. But if you don't, who would do it? That's the answer. You would. Because here's what happened. The 520 people that morning who heard the Holy Spirit moving, and they rushed out in the city and there was flames on their heads and God was doing something. Those guys who might have just been lay leaders or just believers that morning became leaders that afternoon. They needed all 500 of them to have a role because you look later on, they gathered in homes across the city. Where do you put 3,000 people when they're gathering in homes? How many people would fit in your home? 30. Someone said 30. I think if you have a really nice house, you might get 50. And if you put them in your backyard, you might get 100. But that means you're going to have 30 huge backyards at least to put 3,000 people in it. If there's only 50, you need uh, 60 big homes to put 50 people in the house. Where were they meeting in Jerusalem when they're gathering daily? When they're enjoying each other's company with gladness in their hearts, hearts and they're eating in people's homes, where are they putting them? Everybody that was a believer before that day became a leader that day. Amen. Do you know that? Here's one of the most amazing things about Christianity is that God calls you to be one of his people and he, he invites you to be a part of his mission. Right. We don't become Christians so that we can sit and listen for our entire lives. We become Christians because God calls us to reflect him to the world around us. 
I know you guys have been looking at, 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 at Acts the last few weeks, but you were looking at how the church could be a blessing. You're talking about your gifts and how God has gifted you so that you can engage in service in the church and service to the, the kingdom of God, right? I, I heard in May you guys had this vision service where you're talking about where God is calling FBC Bernie to be a part of, and, and I see that we need every single person here to find what God's called them to do and then to step into it. And so what happened is those 11 and 12 guys that were disciples, they were maybe you call them the big leaders that morning, they became the servants of all of the other leaders that day. And it got so overwhelming that a few chapters from now they said, guys, we can't keep doing this. We need to have some time to pray for people and do the things that God has called us to do. We need to raise up other leaders. So they called out deacons. One of them was Stephen. And there's this whole other group of leaders that got established. But I want you to know, if you've been a Christian for some time, that we need you. We need you. We need you here, yes, to sing and to be a part of the community, to give and be faithful in that way. But we need your voice. We need to know what God is calling you to do. And we want to do our best to make it possible for you to do it with all your heart. That's the task of the leadership of a church today is to equip the church to do the work of the ministry. And that's my hope for you. I want to get to these last couple of pieces here in our last few minutes. Without exaggeration, every believer in that church, they were more than just recipients of God's grace. They were practitioners of God's mission. And we have to do the same. Every believer, an active participant. Everyone served, some as teachers, some as hosts, some as givers, some as servants, some as cooks, some as as children's workers. Where did all the kids of those 3,000 people go? Somebody was helping take care of them. And so that first couple slides, you saw the first slide, the two things, uh, we talked about the new believer focus, and then we talked about the Christian living and the rhythms of the church, those six items. These last two, I think, is why a church looks to bring on a missions pastor, It's this idea that the last two here is about capacity building. I read a statistic that churches are perfectly designed to do exactly what they're doing. You know what that means? That means that everything here is perfect for exactly what's happening right now. But if you want to prepare for something different, you have to start acting differently. Do you know that? There's like a whole series. There's actually a a, a whole... um, system of thought about how change comes to an organization. And there's some of those early adopters and then the people that come later and, the, and, and how all these things change and the change process itself. Well, if nothing starts to change, then nothing changes in the end. I want to talk these last two. I mentioned already that there were houses spread out across Jerusalem where these people were meeting daily. They're eating and glad and sincere hearts together. This idea that the the number nine here, this leadership development piece, this is one of the areas I think that the U.S. church in general has forgotten about. The U.S. church loves to call highly qualified leaders and then exalt them in some form. And so oftentimes you have a high personality, a big personality, somebody that's able to bring the crowds because they're excellent, fantastic preachers and teachers. And those are great guys. I'm I'm not saying anything bad about them. But the church sometimes sits there and realizes or forgets that they have a role too. And so I want to tell you one of the biggest things, if we're going to see God do something new and something exciting and, and, and push FBC Bernie forward, then one of the things is going to have to be finding leaders who are capable of leading others that are not on the staff. We have to grow a culture here at the church where people say, this is what God's called me for and I want to get involved and I want to find out how I can do it well. The last thing is that the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. Uh, I I put the word multiplication. Uh, So many churches these days are not growing at all. That's that's one of the realities of of, uh, statistics, if you like George Barna or or any other. So many churches are actually in decline, and people are really nervous about what the next couple of decades are going to look like for evangelical Christianity. But the churches that are growing are growing often in small ways. They, they add by ones and twos, a family here, a family there. But that's not at all what you saw in Acts chapter 2, is it? 3,000 added in a day, and then daily the Lord was adding to the numbers those who were being saved. How do we see a movement that results in multiplication? Where we see God moving in such powerful ways that our numbers aren't just growing ones and twos, but they're growing by fours and eights and twelves and twenty-fours. And and you start going up that scale and all of a sudden it gets overwhelming. Where would you put them, church? 
I asked somebody, and they told me that the, the population of Bernie is around 16,000. I looked online, it said 21,000. So I'm going to say Bernie is somewhere between 16 and 21,000 people. I've heard that a lot of those people go to church. So praise God, maybe this is a very evangelical community already. But within just a little, a few miles of here is San Antonio. I know there's a lot of people that are not following Jesus there. I imagine that there are people here in Bernie that are not following Jesus as well. How are we going to see God move among them? And what is the role of FBC Bernie in that? I already know that you guys have been amazing. I think you have 17 or 18 local ministry partners. There's ministries that have been born out of this church that are active in the community, sharing the gospel, some with the homeless, some with uh, law enforcement. I've already seen that there at the Bevy on Saturday mornings. There's, there's other things that God has already called some of you to be doing, and I am so excited to get along, to, to work alongside and get to know your hearts. But there's more to be done. There's more to be done. As I've been praying these last several months about what God's doing here and whether or not he's calling us to this church, there's a few things that have made me just really excited. Made me feel like maybe this is the place where the Lord wants us. One of them has been that this church has a reputation for having a huge heart for its community. And I can't wait to be a part of seeing how that looks and finding out those of you that have already been investing in that, who invest your time and resources and energies. I can't wait to see how God has already put people here to bring about some incredible change just in the last five years for this church. That you guys have such a new staff, a young staff, and you're such an old church, 120 plus years that you've been established in this city. It's an amazing thing. I think God really is doing something new in this place, and I'm excited to see what that looks like. But I can tell you the thing that makes my heart just explode is that the community that makes that possible is a community I want to be a part of. I want to get to know you and to love you and to care about you. I want to hear what it is that God's doing in your life, and I want to see what God does uh, with all of us working together for his kingdom. And so a couple things. Uh, I'm going to invite the worship team to come on up. And we're going to pray as, as I finish this message. I want you to see more than anything that the church needs every single one of us to be a part. There's a, a quote out of a, a book called The Weight of Glory. It's a C.S. Lewis quote. And it says, with the addition of any one person, the entire organization changes. Do you know that? We believe that everybody matters. And so anytime someone walks in here, what they bring to the table makes all of us a little bit different. And that's a good thing. And so I'm wondering, what is it that God's doing with the addition of everyone that is bringing to this place? I can't wait to see it. Will you pray with me? Jesus, I pray that you would be glorified in this place through every single one of us, that none of us, God, would be voiceless, that none of us would sit in here and wonder why you have us here, God, that we would know you with all that we are, that, God, you would impact our affections, God, our desires, our resources, everything we have would be in your hands, that, God, you'd be glorified through it. I pray, God, that you would bring this church together and that you would unify them under your mission, under your call, and that, Father, you would do great things through this church. God, we know that the needs of the world are overwhelming. God, the needs go far beyond our capacity. But, God, you are enough. You are big enough. And we pray, God, that you would be glorified in us. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.